Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 172nd scale M60A1 main battle tank. Unlike many of the other smaller scale builds which are found on the ECA channel where those builds are built for a private commission and belong to a private collector, the model that you see here is built for my own collection and is not for sale and or purchase. Now since this model is 172nd scale, this is not a scale that I support, nor is it a scale that I work in specifically for commission builds. Typically I offer builds in 135th scale all the way up to 1 6th scale, and if anyone has any pricing or availability information on something along those lines, that information will be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. Now, unlike many of the other smaller scale builds that are on the channel, which those builds are built primarily out of the box, the model here did undergo some detail modifications. We'll be going over all of these detail modifications as well as reviewing the base starter kit in this video. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around the model. And this model here is of a vehicle that needs hardly any introduction. This model, of course, is the American M60A1 main battle tank. A brief background of this vehicle is that the M60 series was the next evolution of the American tank, which came after the M48. The M48 patterns were designed in the early and mid-1950s, were beginning to start showing some signs of obsolescence towards the end of the decade. With the newer generation of Soviet tanks coming on scene, which had better armor protection as well as a more powerful gun, the American M48 at the time A2 and soon to be A3 were starting to lose their technological edge. The designers took what was best liked about the M48 and added some further improvements to them which resulted with the M60. The M60 was designed in the late 1950s however really started to come onto the scene and enter into full production in the early 1960s. The vehicle remained in production status all the way up through the 1970s. Production of the M60 tank family ended in the early 1980s by 1983 at the Detroit Arsenal tank plant. Some of the improvements made to the M60 over the older M48 had to do with the ballistic shape of the hull. The front nose of the M48 pattern had a round frog nose type appearance to it, while the M60, this design was revised to have a knife blade on the front leading edge. This was deemed to give better ballistic protection compared to the round surface found on the earlier M48. Another improvement that the M60 had resulted with the tank's power plant. The M48, when it was originally designed, was actually intended to be powered by a large gas engine. However, the gas power plant was deemed to be too problematic in both maintenance as well as also with fuel economy. The diesel engine was definitely the better way to go, and by the time the 1950s rolled to an end, the U.S. military was switching to an all-diesel engine fleet. Now, of course, the M48s were upgraded in the A2 and A3 series to have the diesel engine pre-fitted into the vehicle. However, the M60 from the get-go was designed to utilize the diesel engine power plant from the beginning. For the engine, the 60 utilized a Continental AVDS 1792 V12. The engine was air-cooled and was a twin-turbo diesel engine. With this power plant, the vehicle had a fuel capacity of 300 miles with a full topped off gas tanks, along with a speed of 30 miles an hour on road conditions. Along with the automotive aspect of the tank, the vehicle's armament was greatly improved from the older M48. While the older M48 utilized the 90mm main gun, the M60 from the onset was designed to use the ubiquitous NATO L7 105mm. At the time, and even up until today, the L7 is considered one of the best overall main guns to mount inside of a tank. For the tank's secondary armament, the M60 was the first American tank to move away from the Browning pattern machine guns for both the 50 as well as the coaxial M1919. For the coaxial machine gun, the tank utilized a 7.62x51mm NATO M73 machine gun. And for the main 50 caliber machine gun, the vehicle utilized the M85. 
Although both of these weapons, shortly after adoption, were definitely deemed to be problematic. When the M60 was first designed, the turret's design was very similar to the M48's, but was a little bit different. Shortly after the tanks entered production, the turret was changed to the pattern that is found on the M60A1. The difference, of course, is the geometry of the turret was drastically different. Rather than the round turtleback type turret, which was similar to the M48, the M60's turret was more needle-nosed in length and shape, as this design was designated to have better ballistic protection. Although the M60 was available during the Vietnam War, the vehicle never saw service during that conflict. Instead, basically the M60s were kept either stateside or were stationed in places like South Korea, but more than likely Western Germany. The real first and only engagements that the M60 had with the US military was during the first Gulf War in 1991. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when this model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this 172nd scale M60A1 main battle tank kit from Italeri. Now this build shouldn't look foreign to anyone who is a fan and frequent viewer of the ECA channel because I did a model showcase video of a model built from this exact same kit a few months back. Because that build went together so well, and I had actually a pretty good experience building it, the next time I was at my local hobby shop, I saw that they had another one of these kits on stock, and I decided to grab a second one in order to paint it with the other option that this kit does have decals for. The model itself has not been in the sash for very long, and now that I have it, I can go ahead and start the assembly. The model was purchased for $23. This is a little bit above what you'll find online. However, keep in mind, generally when you find these kits online, you do have to pay shipping for them, which by and large either elevates the price to around this amount or possibly a little bit more. On top of that, like I frequently mention, it's always good to support your local hobby shops because they, these local businesses do need revenue coming in in order just to keep the hobbies alive for the next generation of people. Now the last time I did a model showcase video for this kit, I went into detail on the kit's history and its background, so I'm going to go a little light on that for this video. But basically this kit here is a rebox of the old Eshi plastic 172nd scale M60A1 kit that was released in the late 70s and the early 1980s. These kits have been in one way, shape, or form or another in production from several companies throughout the last 20 something years and Italeri is just the most recent acquirer of the kit's tooling. The kit's medium is entirely composed of injection molded plastic and do not come with any of the more modern materials such as photo etch or resin. One will definitely see that when I crack the box open and show off the kit contents. With my hobby knife here, make the incision Remove the shrink wrap. And one, with the shrink wrap removed, you can see the model's graphic design. Just like I went over in the other video, the illustration is actually pretty nicely rendered. We have an all olive drab M60A1 going through some maneuvers and firing the Cupola's mini turret 50 caliber. This model can be built in three different ways. Two versions for the US Army and one for the Italian military. Here on the back we have the three color variations. The US Army olive drab, US Army with a master camouflage pattern, and the Italian Army rendition. Just like with many kits there is some safety tape holding it together but this was opened up when I used the knife to open up the shrink wrap. Opening up the model from the side, I can now dump out the kit's contents. Now again, if anyone has seen the last video, all this should look basically identical because this is literally the exact same kit. All of the kit's contents are nicely sealed in one plastic bag. Let's go ahead and pop this guy open and dump out the projection mold of plastic bits. Starting with the lower hull, it's comprised of a single plastic molding, 
Like I said in the other video, it's very similar to the 135th scale M60 counterpart in with the way the upper and lower hulls are designed to fit together. There is some detailing representing the swing arm fasteners, but it's very, very subtle. Like I said, the tooling on this model here dates back to the late 70s, which for the period, something like the type of tooling that we see on here is not just average, but it actually would be considered above average for the period. This runner here is that of obviously the turret. Here's the bottom pan. Now the turret is missing the little inlet on the back here, which on a real M60 is needed for clearance of the driver in order to get in and out of the hatch with the turret pointed at the rear portion of the vehicle, but it's absent on this 172nd scale kit here. Here you get to see the type of quality of the moldings. Here we can see the lift lugs, which are integrally molded into this piece. And the turret is void of any sort of tow cable hardware, which is typically found on these M60A1 tanks. However, on the flip side, the model itself does make for a very simple, simplistic and easy build to do because you don't have those smaller details that are found. Here's the mantlet. Now, this model here does not have the canvas mantlet cover, which is actually found on the box art. On this model here, the vehicle is represented with the canvas, the rubberized canvas, not present. We do have two options of the main gun. One with a the thermal sleeve and one without. And we also have the searchlight. Next runner brings us to the upper hull. Here again you can see the engine deck detailing, which is actually pretty good. Again, considering not just the age of the kit, but also the size. I mean, the model itself is, what, two and a half inches in length, and we do have some very nice detailing represented on a model as old as this guy here. Now, of course, being an Eshi kit, one of the biggest problems for me, anyhow, that these Eshi kits have are the Caterpillar track design. These kits utilize the link and length method, which we all know I am not particularly a fan of. However, from the last kit I, I built, I was able to find a way to put these things together with the minimal amount of problems that I incurred. So with this model, the second time around should go over probably a little bit easier than my first rundown. But I was able to build them together with good results on my last build and hopefully again lightning could strike twice. Here's the rear engine hatch. Again, not too shabby for the age of the kit's tooling. And not to mention the small size that these parts are actually molded in. Last runner brings us to the remainder of the running gear. We have some more track link sections. As well as the row wheels and the sprockets. Now this model here does not feature the row wheels with the with the correct double wheel design and you'll also notice that the tracks do not have their center guide horns found on the pieces. This again is indicative of the error that these pieces are molded in. More modern kits like from Dragon do have these components in much better and more accurate detailing. And I believe there's actually a aftermarket resin set out there which replaces the stock row wheels to give you the more accurate pattern. However, for this build here, I'm just going to leave it with the stock components in regards to these pieces that we have here. The row wheels do have their aluminum pattern for the M60 pattern row wheel. And again, not too shabby. Now for the markings, the kit supplies you with this decal sheet here, which again has the three options that this model can be built. These decals are just your average water slide tallery decals, and from the last build I did, I didn't really notice any issues with the supplied set. Moving on to the instruction sheet. As one can clearly see, the instructions are quite primitive with their illustrations compared to the CAD drawings that we're used to seeing today. But they do do the job and 
from what I can remember from the last build, there weren't any surprises found in these instructions. Starting with the model's running gear and suspension, all the components that you see here are stocked with the SG kit. This includes the road wheels, the sprocket, as well as the track. Now, like I showcased before in the unboxing portion, the model does utilize link and length track for the assembly. Now, as I've stated time and time again, and made as abundantly clear as possible, I am far from a fan of this type of track assembly. Typically, on larger scale models, they are detestable. However, for 170 second scale, for whatever reason, it, they seem to assemble well and decently on these Eshi kits. Having said that, I, again, I would much prefer if they were a single length of vinyl. But if you're going to be working on one of these Eshi kits, the Lincoln Lane track is going to be something that you are going to have to learn to work with. Like it or not, as there are no aftermarket rubber sources that are on the market that I'm aware of. While on the track, when it comes time to painting these units, I like to paint the tracks with two separate colors. This separates what would be the metal connecting components compared to the rubber pads. Now, a lot of modelers, when they're painting these tank tracks, they seem to just overspray the entire track with one color, either a dark gray or a flat black. However, by painting the pieces with two separate colors, this makes the tracks pop and it further enhances your build as opposed to just leaving everything with one solid color. The same tips and tricks, by the way, I also recommend for scales that are much larger than 172. With any luck with my lighting situation here, it should come out on camera where you can see the octagonal track pads that are black and the connectors on the ends as well as the center guide horns are a darker gray. If anyone wants to make the tank even more weathered, in lieu of using the darker gray for the metal end connectors, you could substitute that with a brown rusty type color, as in the field these components do develop surface rust, specifically with the M60s and how they were used, and for as long as they were used, these pieces are not uncommon to find vehicles in field that have rust on them. From the tracks now takes to the rear portion of the hull. Now just like I mentioned in the last M60 build video, the lower hull and the rear wall will have a seam that will need to be contended with by the builder. This is quite standard and common for not only M60A1 kits, but specifically kits from this time frame. There is a little bit of hand fitting required in order to get the pieces to blend in in a seamless manner. Now in addition to having them blend in, you'll notice I left it slightly coarse with the texture and this was again done on purpose. On the real M60, the entire lower hull is comprised of a single cast tub that does have texturing on the real unit. By leaving the slight little cast texturing there, further enhances the model compared to having it as smooth as possible. The rest of the hull, however, went together without any problems. And the only other seem to worry about is the center one here, where the upper and lower hulls meet, which again is common for the M60 family. Back to the rear wall of the model takes us to the model's tow hitch. Now, the kit originally supplied tow hitch was utilized, however, during the course of construction, was probably bumped into by my hand, and the original piece cracked and flew off. A new unit needed to have been fabricated. To fabricate the replacement, I took some wire, and I bent it to the shape of the original kit tow hitch, and then I flattened the wire with a hammer to have it better replicate the original kit part. The piece was then added as is, and that's the unit that you see on the model. It closely mirrors the original kit supply part. Moving our way to the front of the model takes us to first the front tow hooks. The tow hooks are the kit ones and were utilized, however a small tweak was made. On the bottom portion of the tow eyes, if I could get it into frame, You'll notice a small little hole that is found on both units. This little hole was added with a pin vise and a very small Dremel bit. These holes are present on the real M60 and ironically enough are present on the stock SG tooling, albeit instead of a hole it's a small little indentation. Which is great because it allows you to put the hole in the exact place where it needs to be without there being any guesswork. From the tow hooks brings us to the front headlights. These units here are all stock. The only modification I made was on this little support bracket that we have here on the sides. This support bracket is present on the M60A1 family and is missing on most of the 135th scale and smaller scale M60 renditions on the market. To fabricate this piece, some length of flattened floor wire was again utilized for this purpose. Adding these two little details also helps the look of the model compared to just leaving it again stock. Right behind the 
headlight takes it to the fire extinguisher box. This is molded into the model. And the only mod that I recommend is for a little swipe of red paint at the end of the build, as typically on these M60A1s, the fire extinguisher box was highlighted with the red paint coloring. That basically wraps up the hull and that now brings us to the turret. Now starting with the turret upper and lower halves, they do fit together fairly well. However, there is a little bit of some hand fitting that needs to be done to the front cheek sections of the frontal turret. With some light sandpaper, you can easily just polish away the extra material until you get the seamless look that we have here. Once the turret halves were completed, I then turned my attention to the little grab handles that we have on the turret. The tank originally did have these pieces molded in, but they were a little bit on the chunky side and it couldn't hurt to replace them with some thin pieces of handles made from wire. The wire was bent to shape and the holes were drilled in again with a very, very fine Dremel bit and a pin vise. A pin vise is ideal for this type of procedure because if you use a Dremel, the Dremels have a bad habit of turning slightly too fast, which will then melt the plastic and either snap the bit or will drill the hole out wider than it needs to be. With the pin vise, the risk of snapping the bit also decreases along with the habit of the material melting around the bit. After the handles were added, I then fabricated the hookup points for the tow cables. On the M60, there would be two tow cables that would be strapped to the sides of the turret and they would meet here in the rear. These mounts and the tow cable detailing themselves are totally absent from the Eshi tooling and by fabricating them really helps kick the model up to the next level. The hookup points are made again from flattened pieces of floor wire which were carefully bent to the shapes and then mounted in their appropriate locations. Which as you can see, wrap around the sides and towards the back section of the turret. Other wire work that I did was to the mantlet itself. You notice that the two lift rings have been added and these are absent on the original Eshi tooling. Also added to the turret is this little L-shaped bracket which is distinctive on the M60 and the M48 series as well. I'm still unsure to what this piece is specifically but my gut is telling me it's some kind of a guard that prevents the cupola's machine gun barrel from oversweeping the main gun barrel or possibly even the xenon searchlight. The piece does hinge up and down and for this model here I represented in the downward position and again it's just fabricated out of a strip of very thin flattened floor wire and then some more round floor wire was used to bend into shape. On the rear this takes us to the antenna. The antenna again is just a piece of you guessed it floor wire that is mounted to the stock Eshi antenna base. Now the antenna base is there, it is fairly deep with its molding, however to make the wire stick in even better, again with a pin vise I drill out all the way into the tooling and it really helps the wire plug in in a more secure manner. From the antenna now brings us to the Xenon searchlight. Now unlike the last Eshi M60 build I did where I left the searchlight off. For this model here I wanted to include it because most of the tanks with the master pattern I've seen had the searchlight fitted and also it's a way to make it stand out from the last build that I did. Now the searchlight comes stock with the Eshi kit and mounts to the appropriate locations again as per the kit instructions. However outside of that the searchlight did receive some modifications. Starting with the outside you'll notice I fabricate the little grab handles which are present on the sides of the searchlight. On the Eshi kit the sides are completely smooth and are absent this detailing. This again was fabricated out of bits of floor wire. You notice a recurring theme here for some of the scratch build parts and once added again really make the model more enhanced compared to the other way. On the inside here I added the light bulb detailing. On the Eshi kit this component is completely hollow and there's no center portion detailing which is found. If anyone has seen or built even the Tamiya Xenon searchlights you'll know that there is a large emitting bulb in the center portion that points rearward which hits a large reflective mirror in the back of the light thus illuminating the entire unit. To fabricate this piece, I actually recycled a little chunk of runner, which had the bulbous shape, which relatively came close to the shape and size of what the xenon light would be in 172. Once added, again, the searchlight was much more improved. Now, if you notice, the sides of the searchlight are black, 
as well as the rear portion of the bulb. Since the bulb points towards the rear of the searchlight, that portion on the real unit is what would be silver, and a lot of people like to paint the whole thing silver, which is a mistake on your build. If you'll notice on the model here, the only the back portion of the searchlight area is painted with silver paint, again, making it more appropriate than leaving the whole thing overpainted. Topping the searchlight off, you'll notice on the front portion, I went ahead and fabricated a little window. Of course, this is absent on the Eshi kit, but was definitely something found on the real units. The lens here was fabricated out of a piece of scrap clear styrene from anything from cookie containers to nail boxes. A lot of blister packs these days are very common, and this is a great material to work with for fabricating lenses like this one here. It took some trial and error to get it to the right shape and size, but once I had it, the piece is definitely recommended to do on your builds. The last bit of detailing that was made to enhance the searchlight was the main power cable. Now, the power cable receptacle is integrally molded into the top portion of the Eshi kit. However, to enhance it again with a pin vise, I drilled this section out, as well as a matching hole found on the rear portion of the searchlight. The power cord was fabricated out of a piece of floor wire and immensely improves the look of the piece compared to leaving it absent. From the searchlight, now it brings us to the commander's mini turret slash cupola. Now this unit is the stock component and was assembled out of the box. The turret does rotate, as what one would imagine. Now this was left stock, however the barrel is not the original piece. Not because the original barrel was problematic or anything, it's just that, well, I accidentally broke the barrel during construction. This seems to be a common trait that I've been having with these M60 builds from Eshi, and it seems I've been having bad luck with them, because on the last build I had the same thing happen. On this model here, on the M85 50 caliber machine gun, the piece snapped right at that junction point where the barrel shroud meets the barrel. To replace the piece, I went ahead again with a pin vise, drilled out the barrel shroud section and into the little mantlet that we have here for the M85, and a new barrel was fabricated out of a piece of floor wire. Now, one thing that's very distinctive about the M85 is that unlike the M2HB where there's no flash hider or it has a bolt-on type flash hider, the M85 had this very distinctive conical shaped flash hider on it and it was present on all of the M85 variants. Now for this model here to fabricate that on the lathe I went ahead and turned some resin stock down to a very fine point. Once I had the correct shape that I was looking for I carefully snipped it off and mounted it to the end of the bit of floor wire completing the look of the M85. And that basically wraps up the detail aspect of the build. From there, this now leads us to the paint and the markings. Now, the model is painted with the master camouflage pattern, which, by the way, it's master spelled with two S's. The master scheme was developed by the U.S. military and was found on vehicles in Western Europe from the early to the mid-1970s. The master pattern was basically a paint-by-number type system, and each vehicle had their own rough configuration on how the camouflage was to be applied. This camouflage pattern predated the Merck camouflage scheme, which was developed in the late 70s and saw service all the way up through the 1980s, and was eventually replaced by the three-tone NATO camouflage patterns of the late 80s and early 1990s. For the blotched layout, I went ahead and utilized the sample which was found on the instruction sheet as well as on the back portion of the kit's box art. And I also went ahead and found some images of real master paint patterned M60A1s along with a few other vehicles from the period in order to get a rough idea on how the blotches were applied and the colors that were utilized. After the camouflage was done, I went ahead and added the markings. Now, the markings on the model are the stock ones that came with the Italeri, or Eshi kit. And the Italeri decals were very adequately done and went on without any problems. Although, I will say that the decal instruction manual was a little bit on the vague side. And a few of the decals that were on the sheet, I actually had to look up to see where they went. Outside of that, however, they went on without any problems. Some of the markings would include these blacked out stars, which makes sense for a camouflaged vehicle because having white stars on a fully camouflaged tank is kind of counterintuitive. 
In addition to the star markings, we have some bumper ID numbers found on the lower portion here of the hull, which is common for M60s, as well as also on the two rear axis panels that we have here. There are some US Army and other serial number information that's found on the side storage box. And on the rear fenders, there are two more stars, although one does land right in the middle of this black peanut, which I lifted directly off of a real M60A1 that had the master scheme, and it, what you see here is exactly like that real vehicle. Another marking that was supplied is this 16 marking that we have here on mounted on this square, found on the rear bustle bin. Now, the marking is just a decal, and the actual card itself that it gets mounted to is not supplied with the kit. The kit requests that you use a piece of styrene or whatever material to fabricate that little white square. On the model here, I went ahead and fabricated that out of a piece of soda can aluminum that was cut to shape, painted, and then the decal went over it. Once everything was dried, it was then fitted to the rear bin in the way you see it here. And to compare and contrast, here I have the newly finished M60A1 compared with the other Eshi M60A1 that I completed a few months ago. Here you can see the two paint jobs side by side from standard American dark olive drab to the 1970s master paint scheme. Now for anyone who's working on a master camouflage pattern, you'll notice that the green used for the green sections is not the same as the dark olive drab used on the other American tanks of the period. The green was more of a forest green in color, and the way you see these colors is exactly the way I saw them in the reference material that I was studying. At the end of the day, I'm really happy on how the build turned out. This is the first time I've actually done a master camouflage scheme, and so there was a little bit of unknowns going into this project. However, the end results seem to have worked very well. Also, since I've already done a Eshi rebuild in the past, it was basically just dusting off and picking up where I left off on this model here, utilizing the exact same type of details that went into my first build, only in this one went a little bit further with the use and installation of the model searchlight. Although the tooling on these kits are pushing nearly 40 years old, they have aged pretty well and built into a decent representation of an M60A1, in my opinion. These models here for the longest time were extremely prolific since they were released by originally Eshi, then reboxed by AMT Ertl, and in recent years have been continuously re-released periodically by Italeri. The tooling stays the same, it's just really the box art that, and possibly even the plastic color is really all that changes. This kit here I recommend for anybody who is an avid fan of 172nd scale braille scale modeling. Also anyone who is a diehard Patnaholic would just love one of these kits added to their collection. In addition to that, Cold War tank fans would really appreciate something like this. Not to mention folks who are into wargaming, because 172nd scale is a valid wargaming scale, and you can have a gigantic collection of these things that don't take up a whole lot of space. Aside from wargaming, anyone who's a fan of small scale dioramas would also appreciate this kit. With the subject matter at hand, you could represent the vehicle to be anywhere from several of the Reforger military exercises all the way up to even a hypothetical Folder Gap invasion via the Soviets. Either way, this kit here would be a good asset to have. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 172nd scale M60A1 main battle tank. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where you can get updates on new Miles Showcase videos like this guy here, or the ongoing project update videos when they get posted. Another way to keep in the loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There I have more pictures of this particular build as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been posted on the channel in the past. Finally, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks for watching.